All right, everybody, I'm going to hop into it. We gave those uh, people a little time to return to class here. So welcome back to the final installment of our complete course on the construction line. I am once again, Phil Bel Castro, Customer Application Specialist for, with Mintech Resources. And with that, let's take a look at today's agenda. Uh, line 301, uh, running through the slides earlier today, I think this is probably my favorite one. We're going to look at some more of the data uh, whether that be the third party testing, some of the notable projects, and finally case studies. And then we're going to finish up with a kind of a, a new section for us, frequently asked questions. So I'll probably open that up to some of my sales guys for their input before we wrap up with kind of a open up for everyone. So once again, if you have questions throughout, uh, feel free to type them in the box. Um, we'll try to monitor that um, and either answer them live or during the uh, session there at the end. So with that, let's take a look at our, our third party testing. So I've went through and kind of picked out four of them that I really like to highlight. The first one is with an engineering firm, uh, Geosyntec. They uh, did some testing for us with our cow cement material and they were targeting a DOT spec that tends to be pretty standard uh, out there for lime and Portland cement. So unconfined compressive strength at seven days looking at 100 PSI for quick line and 200 PSI for Portland cement. So whoever wrote this spec kind of really understands the difference between the two. And what do I mean? So we're going to step away from the Geosyntec lab for a second and come back to my home here at the Innovation Center where we did some testing. Uh, we wanted to look at the strength gain over time. So we look at that 10 different soils. I've got our seven day strength mark right there and kind of want you to imagine in your head where you think the trajectory of these two lines are going to end up. So with that, we found that about 135 days out, the strength of lime treated soils can surpass the strength of the Portland cement treated soils. So that's something we want to keep in the back of our heads. We don't want to design projects to just last seven, 28 or 90 days. We want these projects to last for, last for years and years. So going back to that specification, Whoever wrote that understood that that lime is going to gain that strength over time. It takes some time for those pozzolanic reactions to, to form and, and run to completion. So back to the study at hand. In the area, we were looking at two different soil types, and we're going to treat these with calcium once again. So you can see the Astro and the USCS classification, but really some low, low strength numbers here that we are looking to improve. So the baseline, those strength levels we just, we just saw are, are there on the left and typical seven day uh, standard accelerated cure uh, numbers are, are gonna be our last column there, but we want to look at two and four day numbers because uh, here in the construction world, we tend to be a little impatient. So with that, all of our points surpass that seven day strength mark of 100 PSI and we've got some really great strength gains on both those soil types. Um, whether that be at the five or the 7% calcium. The testing didn't stop there. They did some soak testing to see how these samples held up to um, really extreme conditions. So after both 12 and 24 hours, they didn't see any degradation. So some great results there, but I say extreme conditions because this is not a standard test. So when we talk soaked samples in the lab, we're talking something more like this. We have our sample, on a porous stone wrapped in an absorbed cloth. And we let the water kind of soak up through that with capillary action, uh, not submerged like we're seeing here. But once again, some great results. Uh, it ended up being a pretty cool study. So the next one we're gonna highlight is, is from GeoHydra Engineers. Uh, they did their own study. Um, they actually titled it Winter is Coming. So it always makes me think of uh, Game of Thrones and it makes me kind of laugh a little. So they, they uh, looked at the study and they wanted to look at uh, how the cow cement uh, reacted with moisture. They took a look at the physical properties, including compressive strength and the subgrade CBR. So they saw some great results here after seven days. Once again, the untreated there was about 50 PSI and at the seven day numbers at four and 6%, we got 150 and almost 200 PSI. So some good results there on the on the UCS numbers, and then the CBR you can see down the, at the bottom of the chart there uh, a nice a nice CBR there uh, at 43 almost 44. 
And they had some observations there at the end of their study. They observed that um, one to 2% moisture loss for every 1% of cow cement LKD. So something that we have seen consistently throughout our years using the cow cement product, really good product. Uh, and then a nice little quote there from the guys uh, that based on their past experiences and the recent lab testing it is our opinion that the cow cement is a viable alternative to quick lime and Portland cement for stabilizing or improving building and pavement subgrades. So in line with everything we've been talking about in the 101 and 201 and continuing here in the 301 section. This next one uh, is a quick lime study that the University of North Carolina did with the DOT down there. And I love this title. Any engineers out there probably love it too. Uh, the, it's titled The Establishment of Subgrade Undercut Criteria and Performance of Alternative Stabilization Measures. Whew, yeah, get your thesis on that one, right? So basically it was a study that, uh, it was a performance and economic study at, uh, looking at remove and replace options compared to lime treated subgrades. And it was essentially asking two questions which technique works better for construction loads and which technique costs less. So looking at that first question, which one works better for construction loads? The DOT and the university understood, uh, you know, ideally we can't do this, but we, we cannot shut down a highway and, and do a study. It's just not gonna be something we can do. So they decided to build their own. Uh, they have really cool system set up here. I would have loved to have actually been a part of this uh, it seems like something that would have been neat to just uh, be able to build these individual test uh, samples, if you will, in these pens. They, they compacted the soil uh, and all the starting soil was the same subgrade. It was a, a lean clay soil with a medium plasticity around 16. You can see the OMC there, 15 and a half almost, and it was compacted just above that at 18 and a half and a really low CBR of two. So on top of that, they had a couple samples uh, with varying thicknesses of the aggregate base course or select fill. They had some select fill in the area. They were looking to see if they could kind of work that in. And additionally, they had some samples that incorporated some uh, geofabrics, geosynth geosynthetics, uh, things like that. And they also had a sample that had the same subgrade and with nine inches of the lime treated soil at a 3% application rate and they topped out with a couple inch, inches of the aggregate base course. So those are our samples. Here's the testing apparatus. Remember that pen where that guy was doing some of the compaction? Um, those are six by sixes, I think, in the front. So it's a, it's a pretty nice scale we're working with there. There's the load cell. They have all sorts of sensors buried in the soil. Pretty cool setup. So that load cell was trying to replicate these construction loads, something like this. Um, before they did any of the testing, they did all sorts of tests out in the field, running equipment over different sensors to see kind of what sort of load do we need to put on this, on this, uh, on this, on our test samples. So here's some of the data. They were measuring the displacement after construction traffic. And I actually had to do a little uh, fudging of the, the numbers here because if I just left it as it should have been, Let's see, actually, I'm hopping ahead of myself. I can see my next slide and it kind of tricked me. Am I, I'm sorry. So for this one, we, we want to see displacement after construction traffic. So you can see the, my eyes are always drawn to the, the big bars there on the right, the 12 inch aggregate base course with the geotextile. That was more or less the bread and butter that they were hoping to use, something they had used in the past and, and seen some, uh, some okay results, but these, these uh, results are, are telling a little bit differently. And you can see on the far left, the nine inches of lime treated soil with a little bit of four inches of aggregate base course on top, really hardly saw any displacement after that con uh, the construction traffic. I believe that bar is about a 16th of an inch, maybe an eighth, I have to get my numbers mixed up. And they also wanted to see how many cycles did it take to get to their failing criteria about half an inch. And so this is where I played with the, the, um, the numbers a little bit because if I really showed it, as it should have been, the, the lime trees soil actually didn't fail after 10,000 cycles. So they just stopped the test. Uh, but there on the left, you can see kind of as more of a comparison to see how the others lined up. So we get back to question number one, what technique works better for construction loads? We can see that the lime tree soil really was a great option here. So question number two, which technique costs less? 
So this study was done in 2010. Uh, so these numbers are not quite maybe what we're used to seeing. Uh, to put things in perspective, uh, a gallon of gas in Raleigh, North Carolina at the time was just over $2. Um, whereas right now we're up over three down there from what I understand. So I was a little surprised it was actually as high as $2, but right after that, we took a dip back into the $1 range. So there's our quick gas history lesson. So here are our numbers, but the same sort of range between the two, the same ratio, I, I believe is true. So we saw that nine inches of our lime stabilized soil with our aggregate base course costs about $10.44 per square yard. Compared to that 12 inches of aggregate base course with the geotextile that I highlighted before, much higher. So our 12 inches of lime stabilized soil, about $5.40 a square yard. That same $5.40 would have bought us less than four inches of that cut and fill with the aggregate base course, or when we add the geogrid, less than two inches of that. So back to the question at hand here, what technique costs less? Once again, the lime treated soil is a great option. Bring in a couple of truckloads of material, treat the problem we're dealt with and move on. No need to, to bring in all that, all the other material, the virgin material on the, on the aggregate side, the trucking concerns associated with that, all sorts of things. So last third party testing, uh, this one is actually a study done by LSU in um, sponsored by the LTRC, where they actually didn't do any testing of the, their own. Study back in 2017, where they, they looked at the literature as well as construction and application techniques that evaluated the lime usage, best practices, test methods, field applications. They also sent surveys to all the DOTs, um, even some folks up in Canada, asking a number of questions, including, hey, do you incorporate the lime stabilized layer into your mix designs? If so, at what, um, what value? So I read through this 158 page document for you. I'm gonna jump right to the conclusions. They concluded that lime stabilized subgrades overperform non-stabilized subgrades. We're gonna see some numbers coming up in the next slide. They're long lasting, basically, you get the stabilization, you get those posonic properties. It's not liable to leach or lose its strength. They're suitable for a minimum PI of 10. So that's something we've highlighted on our chemical stabilization selection guide. Uh, you can see between the white box and the blue bar that, that we're, we're talking about those same PI levels, minimum PI of 10, and that they're accounted for by in pavement design by, by numerous states. So here are some of the numbers I talked about. The lime stabilized soils versus untreated soils see an average CBR of 13 and a half times more, a modulus of resistance of 350 to 1200% higher, and elasticity modulus of about double. So some, some great numbers you can kind of get your head wrapped around. That these are some pretty good improvements that we're seeing here. Now we should be able to correlate these results to a structural layer coefficient. And in Louisiana, the existing specifications were conservative and they could save money if we include that value in mixed design. So at the time you can see the list, they're not on the list. So this is what they were saying to the DOT, hey, let's consider including this in, in our uh, pavement design. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on to our notable projects. So the FAA trusts lime stabilized soils to hold their loaded 747s uh, they're loaded up with passengers and cargo. Um, they have an, the FAA has a lime stabilization specification. Um, for example, the O'Hare modernization project used over 300,000 tons of lime treated soils. And we've had a number of, of others uh, that have used the lime in the past as well. On the building pads and parking lots, the Facebooks and Amazons of today they are not waiting around for construction delays. They're specifying construction uh, chemical treatment up front so they can hit their aggressive deadlines. So additionally, there's millions of miles out there of roads that are not only surviving, but thriving on lime treated soils. For example, ODOT specifies chemical treatment on every inch of their roads. And you can see the Ohio Turnpike there, and we have some others that we'll highlight coming up here in our case studies. 
So the first one I want to highlight is an um, interesting application that we maybe touched on briefly in one of the previous sections, and we'll continue to just do a quick little uh, touch on it here is full depth reclamation. So this I-81 in Virginia uh, was really the first major FDR job. There are eyes on it from all over the world, uh, including Mintech's own Jim Gay. So if he's on, he can talk to this one maybe later during our frequently asked questions section, but uh, really cool application here. Uh, they were able to top it with the recycled uh, asphalt for six hours after placement and save a ton of time and money. Uh, eight months and 7.6 million versus the traditional methods there at two years and up to 40 million. So all that is, is really great. But what's really neat is that underlying section there at the bottom, the structural layer coefficient of 0.37. So really good number there. If they would have realized the level that they would have got, they actually could have maybe decreased those subsequent, subsequent layers. So uh, definitely a success there using the calcium application. Here's an example of a pretty typical drying application. Um, it varied from two to 4%, depending on the, um, the, the conditions there. And those are, um, those are dosage rates that we kind of will highlight later. We've talked about before. And if you've worked with us in the past, those are the kind of the range that we're working for in the uh, drying application. And we're just trying to get back to work. So no surprise, tight timeline. Uh, once again, we're working in the cold and wet spring months trying to keep that work going and Kalsman enabled that, that work to progress you got a nice little quote from the site super there that Kalsman is a great product that keeps the job moving faster when the weather hits and deadlines have to be made and they haven't missed a deadline yet here's a job out uh right outside of chicago illinois uh it was a drying application but we saw the added benefit of modification and i believe norm our sales manager for that area. I don't, I don't think you charge them any extra for that, right? So once again, we were able to see our, our drying and modification benefit all in one. Uh, it was definitely cold out there. This is the picture we've seen a couple times of the steam coming off on the on the right. That's not dust, it's steam. Water truck has just went down, uh, went on the site and, and dosed us with a little bit of lime to kickstart that to help drive that reaction in those cold months. Um, I mentioned modification, you can see me there in the rut. So we obviously improved some of those engineering properties of that soil. Another drying application, but uh, I like to highlight this one because it's just cool construction technique, uh, seeing more and more of it that tilt up construction. So they had the walls in place, tilted them up, uh, got the roof on and um, the snow and ice that were on the site before, they melted. So inside they were left with a wet soupy mess. Uh, and within three hours of only a 2% application rate of cow cement, they were able to hit that OMC. <clears throat> so it's kind of a trend going on here. Uh, tight timeline, uh, wet unworkable soil, and achieving that goal. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's one of our roads in Ohio. Uh, stabilization was the goal. Uh, this one kind of holds a special plate in our Mintech hearts because it was the first official ODOT job using cow cement. Um, it was kind of neat also because we had varying soil types, A4s to A7s, 7% 7 rate. So got enough, made sure we had enough product in there to hit our pH in order to uh, solubilize any clays that are available there. And the, the available oxides in our cow cement helped that. We also brought some of those pozzolans to the table in that cow cement product. Success again, 60% cost savings versus the alternative reagents and methods. Here's one where we, uh, we were able to kind of double dip. Um, as with anything, availability uh, gets tighter and tighter. We can only make so much of this stuff. So we were able to provide cow cement and quick lime to hit that tight schedule. <coughs> Excuse me. So our 15, our 5% cow cement was about uh, 15,000 tons, whereas our 3% had about 2,000 tons um, where we had two different contractors working side by side to make sure we hit those, those, uh, those deadlines, hitting up to 15 loads of cow cement per day to help keep the project on schedule. We're also able to utilize 
storage pigs that help helped our uh, the balance in the production and the delivery schedule. And they, uh, they even had a mixer and a spreader on site there to help us out as well. Here's my last case study I'm gonna to highlight today. Um, and we've got many more we can go through. And if you have a neat project that you've seen success with our product, our products, uh, definitely reach out. We'd love to use them to highlight the success. Um, but this one holds a special place in my heart. So this is the first time we could get back out in the field uh, during COVID. I wish I could say after COVID. This was a slip on an embankment once again in Ohio. It started in 2016. And after a couple of years in 2019, uh, which was one of the wettest seasons in recent memory, uh, ODOT realized that they needed to address that problem. The slip was getting greater and greater. Number of restrictions, including property line, drainage, right of way restrictions. Oh, and by the way, there's a body of water uh, off to the right on that top right picture. Uh, that did not belong to the DOT. So we had to, we couldn't ex extend the footprint of that. We had to basically keep the slope where it was, but we needed to get some strength. So the ODOT spec, you know, had to be 50 PSI greater than the untreated uh, soil strength with a minimum strength of 100 PSI. So by treating the soil with cow cement, we were able to surpass that, that goal of 100 PSI easily. Uh, and we later confirmed it with lab testing. So they were much further into construction, but uh, we, we were working with a new customer out there and we wanted to make sure they felt comfortable. So we were able to confirm lab testing here at the innovation center to show them the strength that they were getting with that soil. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hop right into the frequently asked questions um, to my sales guys on the call and, uh, and Brian, our environmental manager. Uh, if you want to come off mute, I'll probably run through the slides and then I'll, I'll kind of pause for a moment to see if anyone else has any more comments. So one that we get all the time is how much material will I need? And a lot of the answers to all these are, it depends, right? What are you trying to do? We talked drying. Uh, I mentioned two to 4% before. One to three is also a nice one because uh, sometimes all you need is that little kick, that little 1% to get that OMC. Modification, probably a little bit more, but definitely depends on lab testing. We wanna see if we can hit those goals that are being specified by the engineer. Hey, we have an A7 soil, we need to bring it down to an A4. We need to um, you know, shift that OMC. We need to do some lab testing to be sure we can do that. And typically it's in the two to 5% range. Stabilization, once again, on the higher end, we need to make sure we're getting enough material in there to form those long-term those permanent strength gains. And to do that generally three to 7%, but um, if I were to guess, I'd say 4% is probably gonna do it for us, but it depends, soil by soil, site by site. Staying with the how much will I need? Well, you need to check your conditions, you need some data. In the field, we're gonna do that by looking at the, our nuke gauge. In the lab, I'm gonna list a couple of ASTM methods here that we do all the time, water content, PSDs, uh, at Merg limits with your plasticity uh, and your Eads Grim to be sure we're uh, seeing the minimum amount of material we're gonna lead, need to hit that stabilization pH mark. Additionally, the National Lime Association, the NLA has a nice document uh, for lime and soil as well. One other resource I wanna highlight is our, our new uh, lime uh, rate calculator, dose rate calculator. Um, please use the tool. However, reach out to your MinTech contact. We're happy to help. And once again, remember modification and stabilization testing should be performed on that soil. <clears throat> so maybe I'll pause there. Um, see if any of my guys want to chime up. I'll give it a second or two, um, and then I'll kind of move on. And if you got um, any comments, we can always come back to it later too, guys. So how much do I need? It depends. Remember those ranges I, I just showed for our drying, modifying, and stabilizing. Phil, we do also have a question in the um, Q&A box if you want to take a look at that. All right. Hey, Terry, how are you? Um, what are the advantages to... Sorry, my Siri thought I was talking to her. 
All right, what are the advantages or disadvantages of adding only 1% lime to soil that is optimum or below optimum? Terry, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question. I'd say the, the advantage might be you're making a more friable soil that might be easier to work with if you're working in those clay conditions. Um, so maybe if I'm not reading into it well enough, you can um, get with me on the side or try to explain a little better or anyone else on the call kind of maybe has any additional thoughts, let me know. So I, I think I think what he might be getting at there is, is that if you're not drying and that's not the purpose of adding the, the line, what are the benefits? So you are you're absolutely still going to get the modification stabilization benefits but you will need to add some water to bring your your soil back up to optimum so if your plasticity indexes are high for example adding a small amount of quick lime is going to help reduce the plasticity of the soil make it more workable as phil just mentioned it will also in, uh, start to modify those soils one percent is a little low two percent would be a little bit better but we we add lime to soils that are wet for drying but we add lime and calcium type products to soil all the time that are dry and then add water to gain the modification stabilization benefits of increased strength, long-term stability, and reduced plasticity. Yeah, so the key there is if, if you need to add that material, we gotta make sure we properly hydrate it, whether it be the calcium or definitely quick lime. So we'll talk more about that on a couple more slides. So thanks, Dale. Let's see another Q and A. All right, um, how far will my material go? Once again, it depends how much we put down. So uh, I try to kind of build out a visual and we did some math on this. So approximately for, if we're throwing down one ton of material at a 1% dose rate, incorporating it one foot deep, that's gonna cover about a 40 square foot area. And another way to look into that, at that is, hey, I've got a spreader truck that is going to spread uh, about eight feet wide. There we are. Uh, so one pass of our spread truck will, will take us about 250 feet to spread that one ton of material about eight feet wide or so. So I think that one's kind of self-explanatory. It depends how far on your dose as far as how far your material will go. All right, so Terry, this kind of gets in your question what Dale was talking about. Do I need to add water? If so, how much? Um, so there's a couple questions I would ask when, if you ask me that question. So uh, when are you trying to do this? When can you incorporate the water? Depends once again, before, during, after, not necessarily all, not necessarily all of them. Um, so you could do that before you incorporate. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, you know, spread the lime, come with a water truck after it. That helps to cut down on some dust as well. And then the reclaimer can come on top of that, start to incorporate the material. Or the picture there, we kind of have a little train going. We're, we're injecting the water right into the mixing chamber. Uh, and, that, and that's a good way to do it too. It's just, it's important to be sure we're getting enough water in there to uh, properly hydrate the material. So that gets me to my next question. How much? Well, quicklime will chemically combine with about a third of its weight in water. So breaking that down into a little more bite-sized piece, it's about four gallons of water for every 100 pounds of quicklime or about a 12 foot wide by four foot deep swimming pools worth of water for about two, uh, two truckloads of material. So it takes a decent amount of water to properly hydrate quick lime. Now, cow cement, the water demand is, is much less when we start talking about the available lime content of those. So the water demand for cow cement is less. Make sure that we're, we're uh, considering um, how much water we need, whether we need lab testing, uh, but we wanna make sure we're, we're, we are dosing the right amount. <clears throat> One other thing to consider uh, before we start talking about rain is the size of the material. Are we talking pebble? Are we talking our standard construction material where I call it fines or three eighths by zero? Uh, large material is gonna take large, uh, longer to hydrate. So that's a concern as well. So, um, just think about that whenever we are um, adding some water to try to accelerate that hydration process. Um, but yeah, if we we definitely preach, especially if it's not a drying application, get that water down early to help it hydrate. Let's see a couple of questions come in. Um, let's see, also for drying applications, 
you might have to actually add some water. If you're only a couple percentage points above optimum and you're throwing some quick lime at it, uh, that water demand might not be enough. We still might have to add some water to make sure we're properly hydrating. So while we're talking about rain, I'm gonna bring up my Q&A box. Uh, I think Dale, you sent this to everyone. So how, how far ago is also impacted by the density of soil as well as the desired percent? Important to add water. Yep. You know, want to be clear. We want to make sure we're adding the water. Uh, that's enough to hit our OMC. All right, to the rain. Um, just want to do a, a quick spot on this that almost all specifications say, yeah, no, we're not working the rain, but realize that there's a difference uh, between a downpour and a little drizzle. So sometimes that little rain could be advantageous for us, maybe help a little, keep a little bit of dust down, keep our guys cool in the, in the field. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between downpour and drizzle. Uh, if you can keep working, go for it. I'll pause there for any more feedback. If not, I'm gonna keep on, keep on going, guys. <clears throat> Which lime product is best and what conditions should I consider limes? So these kind of go hand in hand, but we, we get these a lot, you know, you know, is lime lime? No, it's not. What's the difference? Oh, okay, well, which is best? Well, once again, it depends. So to answer that, we're going to look at kind of the, the different lime products real quick again and uh, really how they vary in size. So first, large lump quick lime, as large as eight inches, could come from some of our vertical kilns. We are never going to see this in construction. Uh, just one, it, it's out there, but we're not going to see it. Most of this will actually get crushed down into what we'll call pebble lime or crushed lime, which is quarter inch to two and a half inch, depending on what we call our run of run of feed, run of kiln feed stone. Excuse me, I'm used to just saying the acronym ROK. So depending on the size of stone going in, dictates kind of the size of our pebble lime coming out. So that's a nice um, consideration for some projects. You might have some dust concerns, maybe some more environmental projects, but usually we're not gonna see that on the construction side. So the pelletized or briquetic um, quick lime, and quick lime here is I'm actually using incorrectly, at least when I put up that picture of lawn lime, but regardless, we're not talking about this stuff. There's no need to add additional processing to press those into briquettes. Uh, we're absolutely not talking about ag lime again, so I'm not going to be using this in construction. So that gets us down to quick lime fines, which is another blanket lime term that we use, but for this we're calling it 3 8 by 0. <clears throat> we also have our calcium and LKD product, which is usually about 95% passing 100 mesh, so getting finer and finer. And finally, the hydrated lime very fine product, 95% uh, passing 325 in general. So once again, those bottom three are typically what we use in construction uh, and maybe not even the hydrated lime as much. Um, I would say the quick lime finds in our calcium. So what's best, you know, how do they stack up to each other? Well, what are you trying to do? Dry modify, stabilize. And this one, I could I put a couple check marks around and it's probably up for a little debate. See if I get any feedback here, but quick lime has got a, a little bit more of a drying punch. It's got a higher available lime content. Uh, the hydrated lime has already been hydrated. Uh, so it, it, it can't chemically combine with that water. Still a bulk powder, some drying capabilities there, uh, but not as much as even the cow cement where I'm kind of putting right in between the two of those. So some kind of uh, rule of thumb numbers, 1% quick lime will give us about one and a half to 2% moisture reduction, maybe one and a half to be conservative. 1% <clears throat> cow cement will give us about 1% reduction, moisture reduction that is, um, and then not listed up here, but uh, to compare it, Portland cement is going to give us about uh, three quarters of a percent moisture reduction for every one uh, percent. <clears throat> Modify and stabilize. Once again, maybe up for a little discussion here as far as uh, how these all work, but they will all they will all give us some of that modification and stabilization. This is where the lab testing might be able to prove out maybe the best product, and then you got to talk to our sales guys to say. Pricing availability always a concern um, to see which one is, is definitely best for you. And then finally, I want to just reiterate that the hydrated lime, it's a fine product. Uh, so there's some dust concerns and regional and seasonal availability are something to consider as well. Um, some areas it's locked up for a couple months of the year with other processes. 
Um, and they're also, we only have hydrators in certain areas of the, uh, of the country as well. Lastly, staying with these questions, what conditions should I consider Lyme? Well, this gets back to our stabilization guide. Uh, anything over a, a PI of 10, we mentioned before, that's when cow cement is really good. And as, as we get uh, higher and higher than that plasticity, the quick lime really shines for us. Uh, but once again, drying applications, those lime based products, the cow cement, the quick lime are going to be our best option for drying. So I'll pause there to see if Dale, Tim, I'm, I've been able to see the uh, attendee list, see who else is on. Anything to chime in there because I went on a bit of a rant. <clears throat> All right, with that, keep going to mellow period. What is a mellow period? Uh, in the 201, we, we stopped at the beginning to kind of give a, a quick little um, quick little piece on mellow period, but I would answer this question with a couple questions first. And say, one, well, did you add water? Well, okay, my animation got messed up there. What's the goal? Did you add water? Are you at your OMC or above it? How far above are you? What's your soil like? What's the PI? And what size lime are you using? So these are all considerations <clears throat> before I would answer your mellow period question because we wanna make sure we mellow specifically for quick lime to one, be sure we're getting that proper hydration, make sure that we're getting the bang, all our bang for our buck. We wanna properly use all the material that we're paying for. So. Ideally, I would tell you to wait four hours and get a second mix on it, but that depends on kind of what you're trying to do. If you're drying, you're putting lift after lift on, low dosage rates, uh, that four hours maybe could be cut back to two, if not less, um, just making sure that the second mix is, uh, is really uh, pretty important, helps to break down any of those larger clods that might still be, still be working uh, and help us avoid any compaction loss. Remember, quick lime kind of expands like popcorn whenever we're hydrating. So we want to make sure we're doing that before we get our compaction on. So that was really quick lime heavy. Um, cow cement mellows much faster than quick lime. Uh, essentially, it'll be ready for compaction probably before you are. Before we can get those additional equipment on there, it'll. Uh, we like to just be able to kind of keep keep moving, keep the work going with the cow cement product. Any feedback on that, guys? Any, any points I missed? <clears throat> Come back to it if we do. Move along to, does lime treatment affect vegetation growth? And uh, the short answer is absolutely, yes. Um, there's an elevated pH associated with lime treatment. In fact, we want and need that uh, elevated pH for stabilization and even some modification uh, reactions for that that pH we're shooting for is 10.4. Once we get to that point, that's when we're able to solubilize those silicas and aluminas, those natural pozzolans and the clays that we've talked about a couple of times. So once we get to that point, uh, that's when we get those, those reactions for us. However, most of our ground coverings, I wouldn't say most, probably all of our ground coverings uh, don't like those conditions, whether that be any grasses or the crown vetch, um, so what you can do is during your clearing and grubbing operations, set aside some topsoil that you can bring uh, a couple of inches back uh, whenever you are all done. Uh, three to six inches helps you reestablish any of that vegetation, get that nice greenery, get uh, the, some of those roots there that'll help hold that soil together as well. Uh, but keep in mind that elevated pH is not gonna leach out and affect that topsoil, it's gonna to stay in that treated soil. Um, we often get questions about uh, pH leaching uh, and things like that. So as long as you are properly incorporating uh, that material in the, in the soil, that is, as long as you're not spilling it everywhere and getting it into waterways uh, and doing things incorrectly, the lime treated soil, the pH will stay associated with that soil. All right, so we'll look for any thoughts on that after I'm done. Why do I have to run another proctor after chemical addition? Um, so it's important that we're targeting the right, uh, hitting the right targets in the field. Because uh, remember, we are essentially making an engineered fill material as we modify that soil. You can see the untreated proctor where the OMC sits about 15, 16, maybe 17 here. Uh, whereas after we've treated with our quick line, we've shifted that curve to the right. So we're able to accommodate more moisture at compaction. 
So it might look drier, but it's actually wetter. We can get our OMC essentially quicker without having to dry back as much. Additionally, we're got to have the right compaction targets as well, making compaction easier with that lower maximum dry density. So we absolutely don't want to target the, the old numbers. We want to hit the new numbers here. So that kind of gets me to my next question. What is a one point proctor? So some agencies out there have literally done thousands of proctors to develop what they call family of curves. So a one point proctor is used to choose the curve that represents the soil that you're considering, the soil that you're looking at. Uh, you can more or less quickly pound out one proctor mold, uh, see what your density and moisture are, uh, plot that in this family of curves, see where they intersect and use that um, to see what your OMC essentially is, what your target should be. So if it, the intersection of the uh, moisture and density falls on a curve, bingo, go ahead, move on, use that curve. If it falls between a curve, uh, some say to interpolate, but um, I think most just kind of go up to the, the next highest curve. So that, that's a one point. This is a ODOT's family of curves. Um, they literally did over 10,000 proctors. Um, and you can see that that was done a couple of years ago. So speaking of a couple of years ago, what is the difference between a standard and modified proctor? So in 1933, an American civil engineer named Ralph R. Proctor, he showed that the density of soil for a given compactive effort depends on the amount of water in that soil at the time of compaction. So that the standard proctor mimicked the standard compaction of the time. So you can see kind of a, uh, here we got a 1933 Chrysler Imperial. It's probably one of the heavier vehicles out there for the time really, but a couple years later, um, things started to get much larger and heavier, um, specifically around World War II, when planes, vehicles, and other equipment got a lot larger, putting increased loads on runways and roads. So the modified Proctor was a test that filled that need for uh, an adapted test to look at those increases uh, and take them into account. So that's kind of the background, but what's the process in the lab? Um, so. Most of the time we're, we're doing standards, but sometimes um, an engineering firm, um, they have the reasons that we'll specify modified proctor. Uh, it's typically for um, projects that you're, you're gonna see heavier loads uh, and you're gonna need that increased bearing capacity. So you wanna see less movement of soil, things like runways, wind farms, nuclear plants, uh, maybe large swimming pools. We're gonna have kind of the movement of the water that's gonna be putting kind of different sort of stresses on that soil under there. So they both use a four inch mold uh, unless there's 30% sample passing three quarters. So we can get into some of the intricacies here, but that's usually for aggregate base course. So really for soil, we're both gonna be using a four inch mold, 25 blows per layer, but the different compactive effort comes whenever we look at the weight of the hammer we're dropping, the height of the hammer and the number of layers. So um, like I said, usually we're doing the standard, which is five and a half pounds, 12 inches, three layers. Um, one thing I want to point out again is, is moisture. So the modified proctor usually results in a lower moisture requirement. So it's important that you still properly hydrate any material we put in there. So really what you would do is we would treat with our lime and then uh, kind of above optimum and let it dry back to where it is. So that's in our lab, again, those great conditions, but it's important that we properly hydrate that material because um, we've seen proctor pills that uh, clearly have unhydrated lime all over them and they fall apart. So just, that's not the way to go because we want to make sure we're repeatable. So being repeatable, uh, this is a picture right here, uh, uh, lab next door. That's our, our piece of equipment there. Um, on the top is actually the hammer that we use in the field and you can see the mold there, but inside that chamber is actually our five and a five, five and a half pound hammer that we're gonna drop to 12 inches. So very repeatable here in the lab. I've heard lime can be dusty, any tips? So I'm hoping I'm not getting any cringing out there from my sales managers because uh, it's a concern. Some of the things that we say to try to mitigate that is apply that water. Um, can you do it ahead of time? 
Can you do it while you're incorporating? Ideally, this is a great way to knock down some of that dust, apply some of that water to keep that dust at bay. Let's take a look at the size and or even the packaging. Uh, if you really have dust concerns, does the application allow you to use Pebble, Quick Climb, larger size without the fines? However, we've said it before, we like the finer sizes here in the construction world. Um, so our Quick Climb fines or our Calcium and LKD are great products for us. <clears throat> the hydrated lime there uh, is the dustier of all those. Additionally, um, some applications are able to take super sacks. <clears throat> so you can kind of have a use that to kind of control some of the some of the dusting issues or even use the bag as kind of a sacrificial bag. You can put that in and incorporate it and let your equipment break that up. So there's different applications that you can do that. Uh, I've never actually seen a reclaimer on one over, don't recommend that. More, more of an excavator type. Uh, can you shroud your spreader? Um, most folks do this. Uh, if you're not, this is a good, pretty simple one to help knock down some of that dust while you're spreading. Minimize the touching. So if you're spreading with a dozer, don't run it over. Uh, not only are those treads gonna uh, kick up some dust, but you know those fans associated with that equipment are, are gonna blow that dust everywhere. Before I could do my last click here, I wanna highlight on that bag, I put a little piece of sunshine on there, a little picture of sunshine because um, Tim and I were on with a customer one time who was dealing with someone who was trying to basically not let him use the cow cement product. Uh, and he had a couple great quotes that I love repeating uh, that he called the cow cement sunshine in a bag. And if they told him he could not use cow cement, he said that would be like telling Picasso he couldn't use a paintbrush. So some of the folks out there that have been using it for a long time know it's a good product um, and some great results come with it. Lastly, um, what I would say is what's your alternative? Uh, you're gonna go to cements, it's not gonna be as effective and it's a finer product than, than all those, except for maybe hydrated lime. I'd have to look at the particle size. Uh, but you have those same concerns with any cement treatment as well. Can lime products be used in FDR? We highlighted the case study. Uh, here's a nice pictograph of, of what's happening there as far as the distressed roadway incorporating, coming behind it with our um, compaction. Um, dose rates seven, four to seven percent, depending on the mix design criteria. However, uh, I think one sentence kind of can sum this up: for low volume roads with a thin asphalt overlay, with little to no aggregate base course on top of clay soils. So a lot of things going on there, but that's whatever the line products can really uh, be a, a good option for us. So low volume roads, thin asphalt, barely any uh, aggregate base clay soils, so kind of those country road scenarios. That's not all of them. We've seen them used uh, in other places or even um, maybe neighborhoods, things like that. We've seen some success with FDR as well. And lastly, uh, what about environmental projects? So we've seen some, and we continue to see, uh, great success with the line products in environmental projects, whether that being dredging operations, um, where we're, we're pulling uh, material out of any waterways. <clears throat> really, anytime material is just overly wet, um, especially the stubborn material that just doesn't want to give up that water by other means. Uh, whether you're able to decant it off, but you're always left with that little bit maybe at the end that just doesn't want to let go of that water. <clears throat> so we can supply our drying regions for those dredging operations, get some SNS. Here we're um, talking about solidification and stabilization. So that means a little bit different on our environmental side. <clears throat> and we can incorporate them not only with uh, specialized uh, long arm excavators, but maybe some mixing heads there that are you can even inject some of the material with as well. A couple more examples before we wrap up and really open it up for more of a discussion if we like. Um, we've got some on site remediation here on the left, uh, kind of typical on site project. I'll do typical in quotes because especially those environmental projects, they're all uh, so different, even if they're the same in some ways. Uh, but really here, we're bringing the material to a mixing pit, adding the reagent and incorporating. Uh, we work with landfills as well. Um, <clears throat> here's a cool example of one of the techniques that Tim Chillick has coined the mashed potato and gravy technique. Uh, make a little pit with your mashed potatoes, put your this is where I was talking about the sacrificial bulk bag, <clears throat> cover it back up and then tear it, tear it to shreds. That helps keep the 
um, dust at bay and, and as you uh, can incorporate the material that way. Some more examples of dredging. This one uh, working on a, a creek bed. Um, so those top two pictures are from the same site. You can see the excavators mixing the material and, and moving some of it away. And definitely uh, some of the CCR, some coal ash pond closures we work with. <clears throat> I think this might be my last example, but slurry pits, this is kind of a neat before and after uh, where we had some success using the, the lime products. Slip repairs is another application. Um, we see it often on oil and gas sites, uh, but slip repairs we work, we work a lot with, and that leads me into oil and gas projects. What about that? Sure, working on slopes and embankments, haul roads, well pads, things like that. So the lime products have been used uh, with great success on all sorts of environmental oil and gas uh, and a number of other um, applications. All right, so with that, congratulations. We're done with our course. Um, officially gonna open it up for a little bit more of a discussion. See if there's any more questions that came in. I don't see any at the moment. Um, or sales guys, um, you heard Dale Andrews there earlier, another great resource we have. I definitely pull on, uh, or Brian Walker, if you want to chime in too. Um, happy to toggle back to some slides to go over some of those frequently asked questions or uh, open up for any more. I will give that a minute. <clears throat> While we wait in case anybody do, does want to chime in, um, I do just want to touch on the PDH certificates for today's session. So those will be going out um, tomorrow for those of you that requested the PDH certificates. Um, and then just to also tie back to the 101 and 201 level, level um, webinars that Phil has hosted um, as part of our spring webinar series, um, anyone who registered and attended <laughs> Um, all three sessions will be entered to win some of our swag that we're giving away. So um, keep an eye on your email if you attended all three sessions. And um, I think that's all of my housekeeping items for today. So I do see we have a couple things popping up in the Q&A session, Phil. All right, yeah, so the first one from Nick, uh, what would you recommend for stabilization of a sand and material going into winter? Uh, he had a previous project that used cement stabilization, fell apart due to freeze thaw in the winter. Um, so yeah, we've got a nice little cut sheet on cold weather liming. And one of our tips is if you are trying to treat more of those sandier soils, um, you can kickstart it with, with some quick lime to add some heat to let things cure as they would in warmer conditions. So maybe that was part of your problem. Maybe you didn't get the strength we were quite hoping for. Um, freeze thaw in the winter, you know, that's tough um, just because if it's, it's a sandy material. If it was, if it had more, more clay, higher PI, I'd say that you know some of the lime is a little more forgiving. Uh, we we touched on something called autogenous healing in the last session, where as long as those ingredients are still there, we can kind of repair those any of those breaks to those bonds that may have happened. Um, but that's a tough one. I mean, cement is the way to go for the sandy material, um, unless you've got any sort of PI and clay in there that the, the lime could help out with. So. Before I hop on to Terry's, I'll um, pause there to see if anyone else wants to chime in on that one, so. Yeah, it's Tim. <clears throat> um, the, did, did Nick say, was this a haul road? Is that what he said? He did not, Nick, if you can you know, type in and say, okay. okay. But no, just the sandy material just the sandy. going into the winter. <clears throat> yeah, was it, I guess there's a lot of questions that could be asked, like, was it protected? you know was there stone was there pavement over it and it fell apart or was it left open to the elements um and then it fell apart you know over the winter time kind of thing like we see people build haul roads and building pads and late fall early winter run all the construction equipment over top of it um and then come springtime it's back to soil um so you still need to protect it no matter what chemical you're putting in it it's still soil at the end of the day. And, um, uh, you know, in the wintertime, you have a lot of things working against you, like freeze thaw, wet 
you know, wet conditions, um, maybe it didn't get enough time to cure, um, you know, whatever it is. So um, I always recommend if you're going to leave a, a, call it a building pad uh, open throughout the winter to, to work on, put some sort of aggregate um, base on it for the, uh, the construction traffic to run on and kind of take the, take the beating. So. Yeah, that's another great tip there, Tim. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, it looks like it didn't do the trick for Nick because uh, he had a building pad on a precast um, building with a roof and six inches of gravel on it. So, hey, you're doing a lot of the right things. There might be something else going on there. Um, I guess it's just unfortunate we're working with that sanding material and we can't lime treat. Uh, like I said that, uh, so I'm just joking a little bit there. Nothing you can do. Um, yeah. I, I just to add, I agree with everything that's said. Is it? I don't know what testing was done in advance, Nick. But if if it's failing in freeze thaw, it's because it didn't develop enough strength. And the obvious solution there is that one of two things happened: either the ground froze before it was able to develop its strength, and that limited the ability for it to continue the reaction, or two, there just simply wasn't enough cement added at the onset. Yeah. So maybe lime could have helped with some heat there, but yeah. Maybe more cement. Thanks, Dale. Let's see, uh, Terry again. Hey, um, what strength do you usually see with FDR using cow cement? So, um, depends. Uh, I don't think I can give you a straight answer on that one, Terry. I can talk to you more, but those FDR jobs, at least uh, the ones that kind of come my way, have been. Um, few and far between. If Jim's on, he can speak maybe a little more to the I-81. Tim, you've had a couple in Ohio. I'd have to go back to see um, see what sort of strength we were seeing, though. I think I'm in Ohio for the, the city of Xenia and the, the uh, subdivisions and stuff that they do there. Springfield and Xenia. Springfield. I couldn't think of the other one. I think their target goal is 150 PSI in seven days. Um, so usually if you have 50% of the matrix that you're mixing together, so the asphalt aggregate and soil, clay soil, as long as like 50% or greater of it is clay soil. So if you're going 12 inches, you have to have at least six inches of good clay soil. Um, you could still achieve good stabilization out of it. And Terry, thanks for filling us in. He's saying ODAR fires 200. So. I'd have to go back and see at least those two that Tim's talking about, um, look at some others. Um, but yeah, it gets back to, hey, can we use what's in that soil to help us gain that strength? Um, um, so, uh, Donald, I see your, your kind of statement there. I'll, I'll, I, um, I don't see your question though about your um, camera microphone. So if you wanna elaborate on that, let me know. Other than that, that's that's all our questions at the moment. Um, so I'll kind of ramble on for another moment and see if any more come in. But hey, with that, I want to thank everybody for for joining. I want to remind you what we covered here. These are all. Uh, this one isn't yet, obviously, still going, but they'll be posted to YouTube. Uh, you can rewatch, mention leisure, pass them on to someone who didn't. Um, and I've already kind of sent the first two over to a couple of folks this week to catch up. Uh, Kendall mentioned it. Uh, if you attended all three, you're eligible for a little prize pack. So kind of cool. And with that, I say one more time, hammer at home. Lime products, we add some soil. We're going to dry. We're going to modify. We're going to stabilize. And with that, I'll tell you to save time. We're going to help you save time, save money, and improve those subgrades. So before I say goodbye, Donald, let me see here. Donald, we see you here. Yeah, we, we got you covered. So with that, dry, modify, stabilize again, save time, save money, improve those subgrades, help you get a nice engineer fill that will outlast your subgrade. Thanks.